Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome. We are Be Ready Orcus. My name is Natalie Minacho. This is Corey Harrington. Hey. We did not rehearse this. This is going really well. So, um, so today's topic uh, is going to be presented by Nathan Donnelly, who is um, one of the Firewise coordinators for San Juan County and he offers free firewise assessments for properties, which he will be talking about, and that's through the county. Um, and he works for the San Juan Islands Conservation District. I will let him tell you all about his experience with fire. Um, he is a great resource, and it's a pleasure to have him here. Would you like to say anything? I do. I do. Yeah, I want you to start. Okay, she left. Stay in frame, dude. Yeah, stay in frame, dude. Um, let's see. <laughs> we, thanks, thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, most of you, we've seen it at uh, all of the other meetings. Uh, this is going to be the last meeting for a while. It was summer's busy. We thought that fire uh, was appropriate going into June, July. Um, and I think we're going to take the summer off for a little bit. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> if we, we've we've had great feedback interactions here and outside of this uh, room and online emails, etc. If if folks have ideas or you want to kind of keep a thread going, or if you there's something that we didn't cover that you really want to get more information about. Please feel free to message myself or Natalie. Um, and if Natalie gets sick of it, you can just message me. Where um, the the community or, or you know the conversations, um, the community that's kind of been um, happening around the the subject of emergency preparedness has been really exciting for me, and I think a lot of folks involved. So if there's something that's just burning that you need to cover and talk about or whatever, please feel free to. Um, get in touch. Otherwise, we're going to take a break after this uh, indefinitely and uh, maybe pick something up down the road or not. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, um, <clears throat> that was my, that yeah. was my con contribution. Great. And uh, you can go to BeReadyOrchest.org for videos and um, links to a lot of important things. If you have any links that you want me to include, just go ahead and send me an email. So, without further ado, Nathan Donnelly. Woo! <laughs> Hello everybody, good to see you all again. I am Nathan Donnelly and I am the Firewise Coordinator for San Juan Islands Conservation District. Um, it's a pretty much brand new program in the last few months. Uh, I've been creating it from scratch and uh, been talking since I moved here about five years ago that we, it would be really good to get a program like that running here. I've lived in Eastern Washington and Northern California pretty much my whole life and those are really fire prone areas and um, you develop a little bit of a familiarity with with fire and that whole culture when you when you live in a place like that and um, I see where we live here as being a lot more similar to those places than the mainland of western Washington we're in the rain shadow of the Olympic Mountains Cascade Mountains it's a different scene here, so I think some of the, some of what's come from other regions applies to here as well. Um, my my experience with fire and homes started when I was 10 years old when my house caught on fire and uh, almost killed my whole family. We were we were ready to go to bed, and just as we were literally getting up to to walk to our bedrooms to fall asleep, my mom saw a little brown spot in the paint on the ceiling. And that was a nail that had gotten so hot, it was burning the paint above our heads. And the fire had already spread to both ends of the roof. So if we had all gone to bed, that would have been the last, last night of our lives, probably. So um, it's a thing that happens. That wasn't a wildfire situation. It was a chimney fire. Um, but uh, it happens. And since then, I've evacuated twice from, from wildfires, from homes that were in the wildland interface. Um, when I lived in Northern California, and I've also stayed and saved home, saved one home that was in the wildland interface. And I'll talk about that a little bit. It's not something I recommend doing. It took a massive team of us a long time to get this place to the point where a fire could pass through. Um, so it's better to do the work on the front end and, and let it go. So, um, so 
like Natalie said, um, this is a FireWise program that's been brought to us from the, from the Conservation District. Um, we had some grants written last fall that paid off, and I have money to go to your homes and talk about how to make them fire safe for free for you. And there's, there's like literally no, no legwork, no admin, no paperwork, no any of that. Just send an email to Nathan at sjicd.org and we'll schedule something and I'll come out. Um, it's, I have gotten a lot out of it. I've done oh, probably 15 or 20 of them now in the county and um, it's, been, it's been a really good experience, I think, for everybody. People are inviting their neighbors over so that they can see you know, how they do it on their house and then we'll go over and do the next neighbor's house and, and do a whole neighborhood thing out of it. It's been a lot of fun. <clears throat> so this is a photograph of what I think most people in America think of when they imagine like neighborhoods burning down and people losing their homes. Just this wall of all-consuming flames that passes through and eats everything in its path. Um, this does happen. It is possible. We do, in some respects, have fuel loads in certain places in the county that are capable of big, crazy fire. Um, but this is not typically what burns down homes. 87% of the homes in the United States that have been burned by fire were low intensity fires. Meaning, you know, grass fires or something far distant off. Um, and of the 13% that remained during a high intensity fire, most of those didn't burn because it was a high intensity fire. They burned because of something like this. This is a gutter full of old dry leaves. This is, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a fire instructor too. I'm an instructor of, of primitive building, um, living skills, so how to build fires, all that stuff. This is what I want right here for building a fire. If I'm gonna try and build a campfire, I want nice dry tinder. And a lot of our homes have got a lot of this stuff squirreled away on our porches, in our, um, in our uh, gutters, vents, all that sort of thing. So. I find it, you know, really intimidating to look at a forest and be like, oh my God, that's the problem I have to solve in order to make my house, you know, fire safe. There's a lot of work that can be done out there and I highly advocate that, not just for fire reasons, but for ecological reasons. We're living in a fairly unnatural system right now where fire and elk herds and people gathering firewood for all their needs hasn't happened for a long time. So there is an abundance of fuels now. And uh, the way things, you know, there's an abundance of ladder fuels in particular. So, um, but what I'm about to tell you right now is not new. They've known about this stuff for decades. This is a, a laboratory here where they actually build an entire house and they fire. You can't see it, unfortunately, because it's a little too bright in here still. But um, <clears throat> there's a couple of chimney like things coming up right here, firing off a bunch of fire brands. That's the, same, that's the same thing. These are just turned up a little higher so you can see it. They're just basically a bunch of flaming matches, more or less. Just imagine a blizzard of matches coming at your house. That's typically what burns down homes. It's not a wall of flames. It's that one little ember that lands in that pile of leaves in your gutter or that coconut fiber doormat or makes its way into the vents in your attic. That's what's burning down most people's homes. There are other things as well, and I'll talk about those, but that's the easy problem to solve. That's the trip to the hardware store to get the eighth inch netting for your roof vents and taking a walk around your house, making sure things are pulled away, maybe purchasing a leaf blower so that once a month you can go around and, and get away any debris that you share with your neighbors, maybe. You know, I guess they're making really nice, powerful electric leaf blowers that aren't loud and obnoxious nowadays, so you might look into that. But um, <clears throat> this is a laboratory that's been around for a long time, and they build, there's a whole house right here. They build a whole house. They put doormats, they put lawn furniture, they, do, they put a real house right in front of this, and they fire firebrands at it. And this is simulating a fire that's far off. It's creating its own weather that's throwing all kinds of embers up in the air, just like when you've had a campfire and you've looked up at the stars and you see the beautiful red column of sparks that come up. That's exactly what we're talking about. So in a big fire event on a hot day like today, 
those sparks can get some more locked to them and they might have more mass to them and they can burn a little longer and hotter. So they might have a little bit better chance of finding that one place on your house that's going to take. So they've been doing this for a long time. I've, I've gone through um, this organization's <clears throat> kind of database of photos of, of all the different work that they've done with these. And I don't know how many houses they've built and burned to the ground right inside of that, right inside of that place. Um, this is a photograph here of a burned out neighborhood. I'm not sure where it is, but you can see there's six homes right here that haven't burned. And uh, it's so unfortunate, but there are standing green trees between some of these houses. I wanted to use this photograph as an illustration that it's not a wall of flaming trees. It's one house igniting the next house, igniting the next house. And there are green living trees still left between them. Somehow, these two houses on the end, the lucky people in this whole thing are these four people because they live between these two people and somehow or another that got it stopped before it came to their homes. So they are deeply in debt to the people on the ends who saved that corner of their neighborhood probably. Um, <clears throat> and we'll send that, we can send out the PowerPoint. Yeah, this that's a great idea. Um, that's a great <laughs> idea. So the miracle home thing is, is it's kind of the disservice that we are being paid by the media when there is a, you know, a gigantic fire that consumes a whole hillside full of homes, and one there is like beaming on this, you know, in, in all the char that didn't get burned up. And I guarantee you that house had some intelligent people living in it who put a plan into action to make their home safe. It wasn't an accident. They interview those people afterwards, and invariably. Oh yeah, we, we looked into it. We got on the website. We did a little quick search. We listened to this talk, whatever. And they spent a weekend, you know, every few months, just keeping an eye on things, cleaning things up, taking the cushions off of the lawn furniture that are up near the house, stuff like that. Um, it's, it's, and if they built from scratch, a lot of people nowadays, thankfully, are designing from the ground up a more fire-safe home. That doesn't mean a treeless void. That's not going to work here on Lopez Island. We live on a forest. Or, 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 yeah. or excuse me, I live on Lopez Island. It's not going to work there either. <laughs> definitely, definitely not going to work here. This is a forested island. And um, we don't want to cut all the trees down. This is a beautiful place because of them. So trees are amazingly fireproof. On the whole, you know, especially the big ones, they've got very thick bark. They're in a fire-adapted ecosystem. Many of them are dependent on fire just so they can have seeds that germinate. So it's not like fire is new and evil to, to the conifers we have in our area. They are they're A-OK -okay with fire. Um, but when you have removed fire from trees that are A-OK -okay with it for so long and you've got dead branches going to the ground and you've got nice brush coming up from the bottom that dies off or is shaded out, you end up with what's called a lot of ladder fuel. You know? Go into that a little bit more. But this is just another shot. This is a, another burning neighborhood. And, if you could see it, there are standing trees between these houses that are like 10 yards apart, it looks like. Mm -hmm. And um, when you go into these neighborhoods and, and look at the vegetation and the fences and all the things that have been burned aside from the house, they're oftentimes only burned on the side facing the house mm -hmm. because the main fuel there is houses. So that's, um, that's a big part of what people aren't quite getting is your home may be the main fuel that's the problem. Um, fire ecology is definitely a thing. Getting things cleaned up definitely needs to happen, and I'm a huge advocate of that. But as far as what can be done in a weekend, it's like really the, the money that's really going to make the big difference. It's something you can do in a weekend in a trip to the hardware store. So this is a, just another shot of the, the brands that I'm talking about. Each one of those is simply a little lit match and they can come at your house by the thousands. Um, we do have wind here. It's possible. So that's the, uh, that's the, main, the main thing. <clears throat> These are the three different ways that fire can ignite your home. Radiation, which is, which is the, the one that we're really always thinking about, this big massive wall of flames. It's got to be within 100 feet of your house in order to have the kind of intensity needed to just ignite something by pure radiation alone. So that's 30 yards out. 
That's a, that's a good distance out. And the reason that, that I don't think that that's very common is people don't typically live right in super dense forest, you know, within 30 yards of their home anymore. Um, it just is uh, just not that common. And uh, we want to be able to walk around and throw the frisbee and all that sort of thing. Direct flame contact, number two. Smaller, smaller flames from nearby sources ignite portions of the home. So this is where the shrubs around your home or the particular type of beauty bark you're using or that cute little fence that's got a vine growing on it is acting like a fuse and bringing flames to the walls of your home. It's not optimal. This is kind of the zone too. This is like the 30 feet, at, 30 feet out from your home kind of zone. Um, again, it's a pretty easy zone to affect, but it's also the most, I've noticed, the most diverse from going to different houses. Some people have got a big old deck there. Some people have just plain lawn or a big paved driveway. You know, it's, it's all over the map as to what that would be, and it's something that you really need to assess for yourself. But what you're trying to think of is, is there anything that an ember could land in here or that flames from outside could get to and carry fuel or carry fire to my house. You're looking for those, you're looking for fuses, basically. Just typically really big ones. Um, number three is what I've been talking about, the embers and the fire brands. I, oh, who was I talking to the other day? I went on a training in, in Thurston County from a, a guy who does this training down there, and um, he said that the Paradise Fire, I think it was, one of the big ones last year in California, was throwing these six miles ahead of the, ahead of the fire. Wow. My jaw dropped. I've heard of two miles before. Um, that's not going to happen here. <laughs> we, don't have, we don't have the conditions necessary for that. Um, but... It's, it's an illustration that yeah, 100 yards, probably doable with the right kind of conditions. So um, that's, uh, that six miles just kind of floored me. That huge fire that we had about three, four summers ago in Wenatchee that just was just hell on earth. Um, they, were, they, were, they were experiencing two, two and a half miles out ahead of the fire, I think. But um, that's the furthest I'd ever heard of before, before last year in California. So these are the three types that we're concerned with. And, um, yeah, doormats, real common one. I've seen photographs of those coconut fiber doormats in, made out of pure white ash. You know, just an ember there, and it just, it just kind of, that was perfect. It was perfectly preserved. It just, if you blew on it, it would just duck, turn into dust. Um, and then this is the kind of fire here on the, on the right that, that you need to worry about radiant heat from. Um, that, that is that same outfit that, that burns down the whole houses indoors, goes up to the Northwest Territories in Canada and sections off entire one and five acre parcels of woods and burns them down with houses, you know, again, purpose made houses and outbuildings and stuff next to them just so they can see exactly how it's going to react. Um, they take it really seriously. Millions, if not billions of dollars have been put into, into this stuff. And, um, I think they need to put more money into getting it out in front of people. But um, yeah, the one on the right too, if I am um, chief here thinking about whether I'm going to send my engine down that road, I'm going to be thinking about these materials and whether or not that driveway is safe for an engine to go up and down. So we'll talk about driveways a little bit as well. but. You might think a little bit too, if you're going to evacuate and you want your home to be safe and you want somebody potentially to look after it, making sure that A, you can evacuate and the driveway is safe for that, and B, an engine can go up there and do it safely, turn around, take a look at things. And also C, maybe have a note left on your mailbox or your gate or your front door saying, hey, we took off, we're in Spokane, this is how you can reach us, da 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 da, so that we don't have fire and EMS people wondering about what's going on down that driveway and wasting time going up all of our super long driveways and um, figuring that out. So as part of a greater disaster preparedness plan, you hopefully will already have something written down, printed up, ready to go. Like, all right, honey, we got to get the heck out of here. Close all the doors, all the windows, and let's make sure we leave this note on the front door and on the mailbox and make it easier for everybody else who's still behind.
<clears throat> and this is the third one, direct contact with flames. This is, this is a pretty extreme example of that, but it is, it is what we're talking about. It's a little bit of an example of ladder fuels happening there as well. But you can see in the back here, this is a fire that has been traveling towards the house, unabated, and it is about to make contact with that, with that deck there. Um, quick rule of thumb for a home is if it's attached to your home, it is your home in regards to fire safety. If it's a deck, if it's a fence, if it's anything that can burn like a fuse again to your house, then it's your house. You need to protect it just as much as you need to protect your gutters and everything else. Um, this is also an elevated deck. That might be the type of thing that you notice over the years, a bunch of blowing, de a bunch of debris blows in underneath there, filters through the cracks at the top. So another, another thing where, you know, Am I going to want to get in there there with a rake or a leaf blower or something like that? I, I, again, I think of leaf blower as the most obnoxious thing in the world, but this is one use for them that I think, man, that would be a heck of a lot easier than crawling around on my elbows and uh, trying to clean out from underneath there. So, um, and this is, you know, this doesn't necessarily look a lot like Orcas, but some parts of Orcas are dry like this, and the southern half of Lopez Island looks very much like this. <coughs> So these are some of the things you can do right up near your house. Um, you don't want to have a bunch of dead vegetation. I don't, I don't personally have problems with nice green live vegetation that's not full of dead leaves and dead branches in there, but you're going to want to get under there two or three times a year with a pair of pruners and pull out anything that looks like if you held a match to it, it would ignite, and particularly on a sunny day. If you can do that, you might actually be adding shade and humidity to that site and improving your chances of, of um, having a good, a good, uh, a good fire-safe area. Um, <clears throat> building materials are a big one. I'll talk about roofs here in a little bit, but if your roof is made out of cedar shakes, you might think about <coughs> getting something different next time you put a new roof <coughs> on your house. They are what I use for kindling when I'm trying to make a fire. That's perfect material. <coughs> And not only that, but they're, you know, they're not like nice asphalt shingles, which are actually quite fire safe. They're always kind of like this, you know, they're all cockeyed. There's all kinds of little nooks and crannies full of old dry moss and spider webs that um, is, a, is a pretty handy home for, a, for an ember to land into. So I'm not saying go rip off your, your roof right now, but when it comes time to replace that thing, think about it. And when it comes time to fire season, think about, well, I'm going to be extra darn careful around here with stuff like that. Um, and then do, do the quick go around your house, you know, once a month. Take a little tour around your house. And yes, sir? Where, do you, where would you rank hardy plank on safety on, on the second floor? Extremely safe. Okay. Yeah, it's concrete pretty much. So. There's paper fiber in there, but it's all cemented together. So that's really good stuff. Yes. If you have the asphalt shakes on your um, roof, but you know they've got like moss and typical island life on them, you want to get up there and scrub it off. It's not a bad idea, but surprisingly, that stuff still doesn't tend to burn through the asphalt mm -hmm. shingles. I've seen quite a few photographs of, you know, where where two roofs come together in a valley, and there's a whole bunch of debris built up in there. And that all burns up, and it, and it definitely degrades the asphalt shingling quite a bit, but it doesn't seem to do what it needs to do to get down into the